Bible, if you will, and turn to Romans chapter 8. I'm continuing the series of messages in Romans 8. This is number five in that series. It is my intention to try to make clear what is Paul's intention when he gives us such a matchless piece of literature as Romans 8. As I've said many times, Romans 8 is the totaled up number of truths that Paul has given us in the first seven chapters of Romans. Here, just in simple verse form, many of those truths are written. It is my purpose to show you Paul's spirit and heart because he's the first man who could ever tell a human being how God wanted them to live because Paul is the first man that ever heard from God that there was another person who lived in the human. So Paul's way of living and his way of talking becomes an example. In fact, Paul is able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. One of the most important things the Apostle Paul does in all of his writings is to remind us constantly that we need to learn this Christ. He keeps ever before us the idea that this is something new, this is something unbelievable, this is something that was never stated before in the Bible, this was something no other character of God ever had. He says, I am the first that has received this. A special dispensation has been given unto me to give to you of Christ being in the human being. And he says, since that's so, I cannot fail in my mission. My mission is to help you learn this Christ that's in you. Now, it's very obvious when he said that he had not so learned Christ that he was not referring to Jesus of Nazareth because anybody could learn about Jesus of Nazareth. There was even written material about Jesus of Nazareth in Paul's day. And he could have talked to innumerable people who walked with and talked with, saw and experienced something with Jesus of Nazareth. So that's not what he's saying when he says, I want you to learn Christ. He's saying that this new, tremendous, awesome fact that Christ lives in the human being is unknown by human beings, and it's my mission to help you know that. So when he says you've not so learned Christ, he's not talking about us learning about Christ, which is Jesus of Nazareth, which you can see and hear and touch in an outer way, but he's talking about the Christ that has been baptized into us and us into him, placed in us and us placed in him. He's talking about that Jesus, something we have in hand that we can learn. You can't learn a book if it's shut up over on the shelf and you never pick it up. To learn that book, you have to get it in hand, open it up, and study it. So it is with Christ. We have to understand that he's in us. We have to take him in hand as it was as a part of our life, open him up and study him. So Paul, when he teaches us, as he does here in Romans 8, never does do what is common to you and I who have always studied things in an outer sense and never inwardly. You understand the difference there? I've gone through life and there's so much about my body parts I don't know anything about. I go to the doctor and he starts using parts about the bone that's in my leg or something in my heart, and I don't even understand the words because I've never had a great interest in it. But now, since the most important thing in my life is Jesus, I've got to find out something about him. Until I have something severely taking place in my body, I don't really find out much about it. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. Uh, I didn't know anything about aortas until I had one to drop away from my heart. And then I, I asked the doctor all kinds of questions and got all kinds of information on what a, a dissected aorta is. And uh, now I have a little bit of knowledge about what an aorta is. Uh, to think that God put his son in me and I never take time to find out about it is an awesome thing, isn't it? 
Well, that's what happens to believers. Most believers around the world don't know anything about Christ in them until the true gospel comes to them, until the message from Paul's epistles open up to them, until Jesus becomes the whole end of their search of all searches. Only then are they going to ever find out anything about this Christ that's in them. So when Paul teaches, he doesn't teach us Christ in an outer form. We know that already from 2 Corinthians 5 and 16, where he says we no longer will know about Jesus in the outer form. So when he's going to teach us Jesus, he doesn't teach us anything about ourselves. Have you noticed that? Paul doesn't teach us about ourselves. I was in an airport bookstore uh, this weekend, and this was a new bookstore, and it had a whole section there that says, uh, who, who are you and how to do it books. They were books on things that you need to do to find out who you were and how to do certain things uh, to find out who you are and how, how, how to, how to, how to do this, how to, how to do that. Everything was a how-to situation, it seemed like, in those books. The Apostle Paul never takes time for that. He's not interested in how you do things and in how you make it all work. His interest is that you learn Christ. Think about that now. Paul didn't say, I know how to be a good teacher, preacher, or prophet, or apostle. He said, I know in whom I have believed. Now, that's the very essence of this, of this truth. The apostle Paul gives to us the great idea that we're not to know about ourselves because ourselves have been misused, have been uh, mistranslated to our mind who we really are. Because when you came into the world, you were taken over by a false nature. You're taken over by an enemy of God. That's why you needed to be born again. And when you got born again for the first time, you became the real self, the real you to God that he created you to be. That's Jesus. That's what he wants you to know is this Christ. Not only that, Paul doesn't take time to deal with our faith. Now, he has statements of faith all the way through his writings. But Jesus of Nazareth gave us lectures on faith. He gave us messages on faith. He talked about how to get things from God and how to pray and how to use your faith and how some people had little faith and some people had big faith. Paul never does this. Why? Because in the new life with Christ in you, it is not our faith that is important. Oh, your faith was necessary to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but even that was a God-given thing. Your faith is not important because now you have the faith of the Son of God in you. And so five times Paul's going to deal with that subject of uh, crystal pistis, which is the faith of Christ. And when he does it, he's specializing in the new life. The new life doesn't deal with your faith. It deals with the faith of the Son of God. Well, we don't know much about that, do we? We're just learning something about that. But that's the ultimate life that we were to live. So Paul doesn't take time to deal with that. It's Christ you need to know who is your life and your faith. Not all this, Paul doesn't deal with our failures. In other words, he doesn't say that you've just gone back into your old way of living and you just quit God. What he says is, you have not so learned Christ. He doesn't say you're no count, no good, and you're going to go to hell if you do this or that. Those are never words Paul uses. But his message is, if you learn Christ, you're okay. Even if you fail, you learn Christ. So he doesn't have a message how to correct our failures. He doesn't jump on the people. Grace doesn't jump on people and beat them over the head. Grace is just the opposite. Grace says your problem is you don't know who you are. Your problem is you don't know Jesus. So that's why we take time to go through a portion of Scripture like Romans 8. Spend a lot of time there talking about the verses that are important to us. And I sum all this introduction up in these words. That if you were to go to the Apostle Paul in his day and say, Paul, I'm dying. I've got all kinds of sicknesses and diseases and the herbs and the medicals and uh, the doctors and all. They can't help me. Would you help me? Paul would say, healing is not what you need. You need to know Christ. 
Did you get it? That's what he would say to you. And that's why he gives us no lectures on healing, how to get healing. You, you, you'd come to the Apostle Paul in his day and say, my business is going down. I'm about to bankrupt. I'm in a bad shape. Will, will, will you pray with me to get a miracle? Paul would say, you don't need a miracle of finances. You need to know Jesus. He's in you. What would he be referring to? He would be referring to the fact that the Christ in you is the answer to all your needs. Christ in us is our hope. Paul would say in Colossians 1, Christ in you is your hope. But you see, that's a new way of living. That's a whole different life than we understand. That's so contrary to religious life that you hate to put the name Christian on religion anymore. That's the Christian life, the Christ life flowing out of us. So this is what Paul's great interest is in dealing with human beings, that you come to know him. And I, I become much like that. I used to help people with all their needs. And then I would see if they got their help in, uh, from God for their needs once, they'd be back again. If they got healed one day of one thing, they'd come back more healing for something else the next day. If they got uh, a money problem and God even gave them some money, they'd be back before you know it asking for more money. That, that their needs never got met because they didn't understand what God was doing in their life. What he's doing is making you somebody who has a new mind with a new person operating through you, the old person, in the way God intended you to be when he created you. So I want you to come to know him. Our lesson takes up the day in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. We're going to deal with verses 14 through 19 today, just, just, just six verses. And the 14th verse is a very important verse for what we have to say today. The verse reads, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, first, we had to make a correction in this verse. The correction we need to make in this verse is very simple. You can see it right off. It's not the best translation because it, re it seems to suggest, it doesn't say this, but it suggests that there are some who are not going to be sons of God as Christians if they're not led by the Spirit. And that's not so. The leading of the Spirit is not what makes a son of God. So you need to get that fixed in your mind. What makes a son of God? A birthing. Sons of God are not made by leading of the Spirit because that's a suggestion that's in the kingdom message. The kingdom message says you get saved, but you're not going to stay saved if you don't do this and do that and if you don't do it constantly. So the kingdom message keeps coming back again and again. You need to start over. If you fail, you need to start over. If you backslide, you need to start over. If you sin, you got to start over. But that's contrary to grace because in grace, there's no starting over. There's a continuing on by this understanding that Christ is in us. And so those that are led by the Spirit are not sons of God by the leading of the Spirit, they are sons of God because they've been birthed to be that. So that means there'll be sons of God who may never be led by the Spirit. You could add that to it as a suggestion. So when the Scripture says, as many, doesn't refer to the fact that there are some that are and some that aren't. Everybody that's born again is a son of God. That's the point. You get that? Everybody that's born again is a son of God. How else could they be a son except for the birthing? Amen. But there are many who are not led by the Spirit. There are many who never have known anything about the Spirit. And to you that I talk to in this place, you have a spirit background. Many of you have a Holy Ghost background. Maybe it wasn't the fullness of truth, but you had a Holy Spirit working in your life, an understanding about it, a feeling for it. And you'll be surprised how many Christians have no feeling at all for the Holy Spirit. They don't even talk about it. The world doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit. Have you noticed that? 
The world talks about God and it talks about Jesus Christ, but never does it talk about the Holy Spirit. They have to be a real far out, wild uh, blasphemer to even use the term Holy Spirit because he's just not talked about at all. So there are many Christians who are not led of the Spirit and consequently they don't know how to be sons of God. But you're not a son of God because you're led by the Spirit. You're a son of God because you're birthed to be that. Now let's talk about the leading of the Spirit for a moment. So many people not led by the Spirit, but every believer can be led by the Spirit. Where does the Holy Spirit work? He works in our mind. Your spirit has been joined to Christ, and the Holy Spirit came into you the moment you were born again, and he's in your soulish part to teach you Christ. So he's there to lead and to guide and to teach you. Remember, Jesus' last message included three chapters where he dealt with the Holy Spirit that was soon to come on the day of Pentecost, and he dealt with the Holy Spirit as a teacher. Seven times in those three chapters, John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit being a teacher. He is a teacher who has come to teach us. Teach us what? Teach us about this Christ that's in us because we have no feeling, no background, no history, nothing written in the scriptures before Paul about Christ living in the human being, being in the believer. So not every believer is going to be led by the Spirit, but the marvelous opportunity is that if you ever give a mind to the Spirit, he's going to teach you Christ. That's the point here. If you ever give your mind to the Holy Spirit who is resident in you, he's going to teach you Christ. Now, when Jesus gave this last message on who the Holy Spirit was, he made one thing very clear. He said the Holy Spirit will never speak of himself. He will speak only of me. Now, do you understand what a spirit-led person is? A truly spirit-led person is one who knows only Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is not telling people about who the Antichrist is, about the end of the world. I heard somebody on uh, the radio the other day, and uh, they were saying that uh, uh, the Lord is raising up all kinds of people and telling them what to tell this world they ought to do. And said the Holy Spirit has got a great revival going on of prophecy, bringing these truths to people. You know what was wrong with that? The Holy Spirit is not in the business of talking about the world, of talking about what's going to happen in the future. He's in the business of revealing Christ. That's what I said in my introduction. This business of Paul is to tell us about who Jesus is. The problem with this world is not that we need a revival, or the world needs to get saved, or the church needs to have a revolution. The problem in this world is they don't know Jesus. They don't know who he is, and they don't know where he is in the believer. So when the Holy Spirit leads, he leads you to Christ. I jotted down three things that I want to talk to you about concerning the Holy Spirit and how the Spirit leads us. He that is led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminates the Scriptures. How do you come to know anything about God? Well, if you listen to men, you'll know a thousand things about God, and maybe 999 of them have nothing to do with God. If you want to know the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit is your teacher. How does He teach? He illuminates the Word. He illuminates the Scriptures. He makes the scriptures real to you. I was talking to somebody the other day, a lady in fact, and she said, I'm so desperate to know the Lord. And she said, I read my Bible all the time, but she says, I never get anything. In fact, she said, I, I have joined in with uh, somebody who sells Bibles who have a Bible reading course to get through the Bible every year, the whole Bible. I go through it every year. But she says, I still don't get anything out of it. And she says, I wonder what my trouble is. Oh, I said, the first place, you're trying to read the Bible to say that you got something out of it, but you didn't read the Bible for the Bible to say something to you. You're telling us what you got out of it or what you did, but not what the scriptures say to you. 
I said, you'd done better if you'd have read three or four verses and stayed on them a whole year and let the Holy Spirit talk to you than read the whole Bible through and not know anything for sure. You see the difference there? I always like to talk. I had a sister pastor one time uh, in a church I pastored who got hung up on Ephesians 1, and for six months he talked and preached out of Ephesians 1. Every time he met a group, it was out of Ephesians 1. It became so real to him. I asked him when he was going to get out of Ephesians 1. He said, I don't know. I haven't come to the end of it yet. That was many months later. Why? The Holy Spirit was illuminating the Scriptures to him. He was, he was having the Holy Spirit to light up, <coughs> light up these verses of Scripture that he didn't know the fullness of. And of course, none of us know for sure. None of us know for sure what God meant when he said something in this book. We need the help of the Holy Spirit to teach us. It's not how much of the Bible you read. It's whether or not the Holy Spirit is illuminating where you are. Is he illuminating the scriptures to you? Multitudes of people read the Bible and get absolutely nothing out of it but history. There's no life in history. There's no life in reading a lot of the Bible. The life is in the Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. So the Bible is a sonship book. I had an old friend by the name of Finus Dake. I don't know whether you ever saw a Dake Bible or not. They've become rather famous these days. But Dake used to come to my meetings when I had big meetings over in Atlanta, Georgia. He'd come to the meeting. I got to know him. I went to his home uh, and had fellowship with him. And at that time, he was printing this Bible. He was laying out this Bible. I'll never forget it. In his office, he had big sheets. You see the page of a Bible here? Well, when they lay out a Bible, they do it on big sheets like this with big letters. <laughs> and so he had all those big sheets in there of this Bible he was putting together with his, his uh, uh, unbelievable notes he put in that Bible. And uh, he, he, was, he was a great man, no doubt about it. Uh, he said God gave him the, the, the gift of the Bible. That's what his gift was. He said God gave me the gift of the Bible. And that meant that he knew everything that the Bible said in the verses. He, he claimed to know where almost every verse in the Bible was. Well, I was uh, talking with him uh, at one time, and I, uh, I said, you really know the Bible like that? Of course, I didn't. I had never read the Bible through one time. In fact, I've never read the Bible through from Genesis to Revelation in one time in my life still. So I said, you sure you know all those verses? He said, well, it's up to the Lord. So I'll tell you what I did. I went over to Habakkuk. I don't even know how to spell Habakkuk. I'd never preached out of Habakkuk. But I went over to Habakkuk and picked out a scripture in the middle of a chapter. And I quoted that scripture and I said, now you know where that scripture is? Oh, yes, he said, that's Habakkuk. He said, I know the scripture before it and after it. And he quoted them verbatim. He knew the Bible. But you know what? He didn't know Jesus as his life. He had missed that entirely. He had missed the birthing entirely. A great man, but he had missed it. What am I saying to you? When you're led of the Spirit, the Bible is illuminated to you. Don't be in a hurry to read it all. Pick out something in Paul's epistles and stay there till the Holy Spirit illuminates it, lights it up, because until there's illumination, there's no revelation. Now fix that in your mind. Until the scriptures are illuminated to you, there'll be no revelation of Christ, because the Holy Spirit is the one that reveals it. Paul would say, these deeper things are revealed unto you by his Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's the one that's going to reveal these things to you. So he that is led by the Spirit has illumination. Second, he that's led of the Spirit is freed from slavery. Now I use the word slavery here because it gets our attention a little bit better. Paul said in Galatians, Stand therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free, and be no longer entangled with the yoke of bondage. So when you're led of the Spirit, you are freed from the yoke of bondage. You are freed from slavery. 
What is bondage? It's slavery. What is slavery? It's bondage. You are freed from that by the Holy Spirit. You're not freed from that uh, because you have rope around you and somebody cuts the rope. That's not freedom. Freedom is in the mind. Freedom is where the Holy Spirit works. You understand that? Real freedom is in your thinking. A person can be in jail and be free. Uh, we, we're getting more mail these days from prisoners who have had revelations of Jesus Christ that are absolutely astounding. We've got uh, a two-page uh, article coming up in our next magazine of a prisoner who could just see so clearly the life that was in Christ. Uh, they're not free in body. They're still slaves in body. And this fellow's in for many, many years. Uh, I can't remember exactly. He's in more than one lifetime. He's in prison. But he's been freed from slavery. Where was his slavery? In his mind. In his mind. Because it doesn't matter if you're in jail, in the hospital, uh, wherever you are, if you're bound in body. That doesn't hurt like if you're bound in your mind. And where is it that believers are bound? They're bound in their mind. That's where they're slaves. They're slave to the doctrine. They're slave to churchanity. They're slave to the ways of men. They're slaves. They're slave to their Bible reading. They're slave to tithe pay. And I'm so glad we don't have that word in our vocabulary anymore. People are slaves to that. I run across somebody this past week and says, I need to get back to God. I've been uh, stealing tithes from him. And the, I don't suppose he likes me, but I said, I think that's impossible, but you believe what you want to believe. Because there is no tithe. There's a love gift you bring, but there's no tithe in grace. You see, we've been freed from that. We're no longer slaves to this outer bondage. But to be slaves... In your mind, inwardly, is the most awful bondage there is. So the Holy Spirit's the only one that leads us away from that slavery. And then third, we've been freed from ourselves to have a new father. We've entered into the fatherhood of God. You know how precious that is? Did you know that the whole fullness of God's plan ends with the Father? Jesus in the Lord's Prayer said, Father, you have given them to me. I return them back to you. The fullness of the plan of God ends with the fatherhood. Not in the Holy Spirit, not in the Son, but these two work that the Father might have his plan consummated eternally as well as in our life. That's his plan, to consummate his plan in us. That's what he's doing. So it ends with the Father. Jesus said, I pray for you that you'll be one with me as I'm one with the Father. Because the whole plan of God ends up in fatherhood. He is our Father. How is that? He birthed us. It isn't the Son who birthed us. It's the Son who died and took care of our sin and gave the Father the right to birth us, but it's the Father who birthed us. So the Holy Spirit is leading people to the fatherhood of God. I wish you could have heard Richard Mounts. Uh, I don't know if I told you this or not. He's the man who leads music in our camp meetings. And uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the doctor pronounced him from just a simple blood test that he had cancer. And it was, it was an astounding thing. He had no idea that he had anything like that wrong with him. But when he got the test back and the doctor said, it is indeed cancer, he called me up on the phone that day. And he said, you know, I've had a most wonderful experience. I didn't know anything was going on. I said, well, what in the world's happened to you? He said, I've had the most wonderful experience because he said, for the first time in my life, the father has become more real to me than anything that's ever happened in my life. He said, I have never been so in love with the Father as I am now. Well, I said, praise the Lord. 
And then the conversation got changed and he said, the doctor just told me I had cancer. What happened to him when he hit a catastrophe? What did the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit didn't say to him, we're going to get rid of this cancer. The Holy Spirit brought him into a family relationship that was so deep and so rich that there would be nothing that happened in his life that could upset that relationship between him and the Father. We're going to talk about that. That's the Abba Father experience. So they that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Now let's talk about the latter part of that line. They are the sons of God. What is a son of God? Well, mostly sons of God are unknown. Sonship is unknown generally in Christianity. It's just if the preacher reads those words, do we ever hear about them? But sonship is something very important because it's something that comes out of the birthing. When the father births his own, they are called sons of God in the scripture. Now that includes the ladies, the girls, women too. Uh, just like when the bride is talked about, that includes men. So the scripture uh, had more or less done away with the uh, fact that there are men and women and says in Christ there is no male or female. It wasn't a big thing to the writers there. It's a big thing to the modern writers today to get all that separated. Since they don't know who they are, they like to have what's written uh, trying to explain who they are, but that's not where you get who you are. You get that from the work of the Holy Spirit. So the sons of God is a very thrown about term. In fact, there are a whole lot of uh, groups that claim to be sons of God. The Masons will claim to be sons of God. Uh, my daddy was an odd fella. He, that's a lodge. He, he was not an odd fella. Uh, <laughs> but he belonged to a lodge called the Odd Fellas, and uh, they call themselves sons of God. And then there are innumerable groups that have some weird doctrine who say they are the sons of God. There's always been that, always been somebody that claimed that term that they are the sons of God. Well, who are the sons of God? They are the people who can become a son the only way sons can become, by birthing. You can't be a son unless you have a father. And the father can't produce a son unless he has a seed, unless he has a place to put it in an egg. So sons of God is not a special group. It's anybody that's been birthed by God. Isn't that simple? You have to be birthed by God to be a son of God, to be a son at all. And so the sons of God are those that are birthed by God. But if you look down to the 19th verse, the last verse in our text for today, it says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now here's a term that's greatly misused too, the manifestation of the sons of God. I have in my lifetime run across groups who believe that they are the spiritual manifested sons of God. They believe they are that. Or they believe that they have the only doctrine that can produce that, that they may not all be that now, but they are in a way of believing that they're going to become sons of God manifested sons of God. And so they make a lot out of this term. Well, a manifested son of God to me has two meanings, two different meanings. First, let's talk about the meaning that has to do with all of us right now. A manifested son of God is anyone who is birthed by the heavenly father who in their life manifests Jesus in some way. Isn't that simple? If you do something as under the Lord and for the Lord and as the Lord, you're a manifested son of God or daughter of God. You understand that? Anytime Jesus comes forth out of you in any way, by word or deed or even thought, that's a manifestation of the sons of God. Isn't that simple? No special doctrine, just anybody that has Christ in them and can say with Paul, I no longer live, Christ liveth in me. That's a manifested son of God. Well, now that's the simple way to look at it. But this verse points to something else. In fact, this verse points over to the 23rd verse. Go a little bit further to the 23rd verse. That's not in our text, but it answers this 19th verse. And not only they, but ourselves 
also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Oh, what is a final manifested Son of God whenever the human body is glorified on the resurrection morning? That's the final manifestation of the Son to God on the resurrection morning. Well, that's good news, isn't it? Because one day you're going to have a body as glorified as your spirit. Right now, you don't have that. So two or three times in Paul's writings, he says we are saved now, but only by faith because we wait the resurrection morning. In another place, he says we are saved only in spirit and salvation will be complete on the resurrection morning when we are saved in body. Paul mentions that. Well, that's good. But I'm perfectly saved in spirit. The real me is saved. But my body, which is the old clay pot that Jesus lives in, won't be saved finally until the resurrection morning. That's the manifestation of the sons of God. So there are two points to a manifested son of God. You manifest sons of God when Jesus is your life and works through you. You will be a manifested son of God on the resurrection morning. Whatever you do as a Christian now is a manifestation of the sons of God and a manifestation of the Christ that is in you. Well, you'll notice in that text we read in the 23rd verse, it mentioned the word adoption. And now our next verse takes us into that. Go to verse 15 in Romans 8. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. First line of that talks about this slavery business again. We are not slaves or bondage to Christ or in bondage to Christ. You understand that? Every once in a while, uh, I made a statement I heard years ago that I am uh, no longer bound by Satan, I'm bound by Christ. Well, that doesn't make me a slave, but it, it's an attempt to show that I would give my life to Jesus as well as I gave it to the devil. That Jesus has his right a, uh, priority over me as did Satan. Bondage. We have not received the spirit of bondage. But we've received the spirit of adoption. What is our greatest bondage? What is the greatest bondage and fear a Christian has? It's in his daily living. It's in his daily living. The greatest bondage we have has to do with our circumstances and situations of life. Just living enough money, enough things, right relationships, raising the family, the marriage, the home. These are the greatest issues of life for us. These are the issues where Christ comes forth in our life. You understand that? If you live somewhere where you didn't have your issues of life, there would be no place for Christ to come forth. But of course, you couldn't live any place like that. Uh, you, you couldn't go out on a, a desert island or, or an island in the Caribbean, let's say, and live by yourself and not have to produce Christ. You'd have to because even there you'd be faced with circumstances and situations. There's no way you can get away from that. So it's in the issues of life that we get into bondage. We get tied down by things. We get worried by things. We get upset by things. We grieve over things. See, uh, if something severe happens in our journey, it so upsets us. Well, that's, that's the bondage to fear. Things. It has to do with things. But he says we've not received the spirit of bondage, but we've received the spirit of adoption. And we need to talk about adoption for just a moment. What is this adoption? Well, adoption is something that comes to a birth child of God. 
Now I need to separate two terms for you that are important. That's the term born again and the term adoption or a child of God and adoption. How can you be both? Because the scripture clearly teaches both. Who is a son of God? Who is a bona fide son of God? It's somebody that God has birthed himself. A bona fide son of God is one in whom God has placed his incorruptible seed. Peter said, being born again, not of the corruptible, but of the incorruptible seed, Christ the Word of God. Being born again by the incorruptible seed. How did I get rebirth? A new seed was put in me. How do you become a son of God? In that seed is sonship. In that seed is the Christian. In that seed is eternal life. It's all in that seed. That's how you become who God intends that you be. It's in the seed. As you know, I like to talk about the acorn. The acorn's no bigger than the end of my finger there. But in an acorn is a huge oak tree with maybe a million leaves, thousands of branches, a big trunk over five foot around is in that little seed called an acorn. In the God seed that was put in you when you were rebirthed, born again, saved, is a full, total, complete Christian, a son of God. What is a son of God? One who has come out of the seed, the seed. The seed is God's great act of love put into you. It's John 3, 16. I like to paraphrase it. For God so loved the sinner that he took his only begotten son and made him his sperm and put that sperm in us that we would not perish but have the everlasting life of Christ in us. We would never perish because we have that life in us. It's in the seed. A son of God is the product of the seed. Born again. How important that is. Not only were we born again, but we received the God nature. A son of God has a God nature. He has the nature of his father. Peter said we are partakers of divine nature. So we have the nature of our father in us. That's what makes us son of God. He has the God nature in Of course, all of us would like to feel it and see it more. I'd like to see it in all of you as much as you want to see it in me. But we have it whether it's seen or not. We have the divine nature in us. Our course of living upon this earth is to bring forth that divine nature. So God creates circumstances and situations so that'll happen. So that that nature comes forth out of us. So he lets us have hard times so that the God nature can come out of us. What is it the world needs to see? Jesus. What Jesus are they going to see? The one that's in you and I. There's not another Christ except the one that's in you and I. And if we don't manifest that Jesus by the God nature, then the world will never see Jesus. They'll hear a lot about him, but they'll never see him. So you have the God nature in you. And remember, you don't have a God nature and a Satan nature at the same time. That's what the cross did. The cross took out the sin nature. It took out the Satan nature. You are rebirthed. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. People don't like to hear that because religion hasn't accepted that before because it's not accepted the God nature in the believer yet like the scriptures teach. But you have the God nature in you and the old sin nature is gone. You say, well, I still sin. That's not because you have a sin nature. That's because you have an unchanged mind because you would never sin if you were not willing it by your mind. You will it in your mind. So Paul said, what you need to do is get a renewed mind. You don't need to keep praying that you get free of the sin nature. You need to pray that you'll get your mind renewed and that you'll have a new mind in Christ Jesus. Well, you've been birthed. 
how can you be birthed and be adopted at the same time? They sound like the same thing to us in the English language, don't, do they not? But in the scriptures, they are two different things. A person who is rebirthed is also adopted. Now, the best way to explain that before I go into detail is that the birthing is a spiritual relationship with God. The adoption is a legal relationship with God. Adoption. Over in uh, Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul deals with adoption again there. In this place, he deals with adoption based on a illustration from a Jewish family. It was simply like this. The Jewish families, when their children were born, as soon as that child could be taken away from the parents, was put in the slave quarters and raised by the slaves. The reason for this was that the slaves were the teachers. They were the ones who would raise that child up to handle the great responsibilities of the family. That child would be raised and trained and taught in the family pro profession. Whatever the, if the father was a farmer, the child would be raised to be a farm, farmer. If the, uh, if the father was a doctor, the child would be raised in medicine. The slaves lived in the families generation after generation with this same knowledge of how to raise the children of that family. And so as soon as the child could be turned over to the tutors and governors, the slaves and the family, it was done so. And then the father would watch the progress of the son growing up. He'd watch it. And he'd go in every once in a while and talk to the head slave and say, how my son coming along? Well, better. He's doing better. He's learning. He's this. He's that. But he's not where he ought to be. He's got a lot more to learn. And so as time went by, this happened again and again, where the father would find out what's happening. Is he going to be able to uh, finally take his position at my table and my business and so forth? And the scripture said that they were under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. So one day he'd go in and ask the slave, how's my son? Said, well, I believe he's ready to sit at your table. I believe he's ready to act like a man. I believe he's ready to take over some responsibility. And so the father would make the decision, okay, let's bring him into the house now. Uh, sounds a little crude, but that's generally the way it happened. They were under tutors and governors until the time appointed by the father. And Paul goes on to say, and so were many of us under tutors and governors until a time appointed of the Father. That's one side of adoption. I like to talk about the Rockefeller family. I don't know any of the Rockefellers, so if when I talk about them, you think I've got something special going, you're wrong. I just read about them once in a while. I'm not just being a name dropper. I read about them. And one important thing about the Rockefeller family is that when they bear a child, any child born into the Rockefeller, immediate Rockefeller family, that child has set aside for them a $21 million trust fund. So that when that child becomes 21 years of age, they automatically have $21 million. And the stories that come out of that are just unbelievable, and that's what you follow, all these stories of how these kids try to get their money before they're 21. They rob, they steal, they, they borrow, they do everything they can to get a hold of some of that money, just like any other human being would do. They get in the fix, and they'd want that money right off. But they can't touch that money till they're 21. What is adoption? If it is a legal thing, what does it mean? Well, in simplicity, it means the two things these two stories I've told you bear. The spirit of adoption that comes into us. Notice this verse. For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. When you know God is your Father, the spirit of adoption comes to you. That spirit comes to you the moment you are born again. That's in Christ. That's in the seed. What does that mean? 
That means that you never have to be under tutors and governors if you know your father. But more so, a Rockefeller has to wait 21 years to get his inheritance. The spirit of adoption means that the moment you're born again, everything God has is yours. No tutors and governors, no waiting, no probation, no time element. Instantly, when anybody is born again, they receive the spirit of adoption whereby they cry, Oh, he indeed is my father now giving me his all. Scripture for that. Look at verse 17 in our text. And if children, if born again children of God, then are they heirs. When are they heirs? When they're children. When you're born again, when are you an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ? The moment you're born again. If you claim God as your Father, and if the Holy Spirit bears witness with you that you are a child of God, you instantly have the inheritance. And the instant inheritance comes under the legal term of adoption. What does it mean? A newborn babe in Christ never has to wait for his inheritance. He never has to wait for the blessings of God. He never has to wait for answers to prayer. He's not put on probation. He's not given a catechism and says, if you pass it, you're one of us. He's not told, if you get water baptism or you take our doctrines up, you can be in our church. Instantly with God, he receives the fullness of everything God has to give a newborn child. Furthermore, in the scriptures, the Apostle Paul never labels an ongoing believer as a child, a babe in Christ. We're called children but never a babe in Christ. Only one time is the term babe of Christ used, babe in Christ, used by the Apostle Paul, and that's in Corinthians where he was dealing with the carnality, a group of people who didn't know who they were in Christ. They had one foot in the God of Diana and another foot in Christianity. They didn't know who they were. They were not where they ought to be with God. And the end result was he called them babes and they had to go on milk. Paul never says that anywhere in his scriptures outside of that one place. What does he do? Every verse of scripture Paul deals with deals with the believer as if he has been fully adopted no waiting period. He's in the family, even though he's dumb, ignorant, and has many problems. He's in the family, and the full inheritance is his. That's what adoption means. You've been adopted. It's all yours. It's yours in Christ, praise God. You don't have to wait for it any longer. How does God look at you when you've been birthed? He sees you as maturity. Why? You say, well, I'm so dumb and ignorant, how could I be mature? Because you're not the maturity Christ is. You understand that? When God looks at you, if you have been giving Christ your mind, God sees you as a Christ person mature. How does God deal with us then in our failures and our shortcomings? He deals with you on the basis of the knowledge you have. We're all at different levels of knowledge. Some of you know more about God than others. Some of you have gone through different circumstances than others have. So when God deals with you, he deals with you on the level of your knowledge. You understand that? You take somebody that's had a hard life 
I mean, they've just never gotten out of trouble, just been one trouble after another. God deals with them differently. They know something others don't know. They may have a wisdom others don't have. God banks on that in them. There may be somebody that just doesn't know much about God. They're saved. They love the Lord as best they know how, and that's how God deals with them, on that basis of what they know. That's what grace is. Grace has God fixed as somebody who loves you and takes care of you regardless of anything and not on merit. You don't earn him. You don't pay for him. You don't become wise to get him. You've got God because he's your father. There are two things in our lesson today that are most important. If you see God as your father, and you are led by the Spirit, then the Spirit of adoption is working in you. So that when you pray, you don't have to pray, oh God, I've got this awful problem here, come and help me. You say, Father, I know that you know all about me, and I know that all things are mine, but you know best what it is to do for me now, and I trust you to do what you need to do. You ever prayed that way? You'd do well to do it because that's the way it's going to work. Sometimes God's going to give you right off what he thinks you need. Other times, you're not going to get it. It's just not going to come. But adoption is the place you come to when you know he's your father and you're led by the Spirit in what you do. Think about it. Today I want to give you five things in closing that I think will help you to know your position as a child of God and a son of God. I think it's very important that we think sometimes about my position and place in the world and in life. Point number one, a son of God is one who is constrained by the love of God. Constrained by the love of God. What does that mean? That simply means that a son of God is always controlled by the love of God. Now that's a hard, hard subject. To be controlled by the love of God is a hard subject because I've seen a lot of situations that weren't lovable, and I deal with a lot of people that aren't lovable. So I've had to learn a lot along the way about being constrained by the love of God. That is, in every event of life, I'm controlled by love. Can you say that? Think about everything that happens to you. You get mistreated at the grocery store, or, or uh, somebody jumps on you uh, for something, or some relative uh, harms you in some way. Uh, are you constrained by love? That means are you controlled by love at that moment? Well, that's kind of hard to say, isn't it? Well, I've had to wrestle with that all my life. And I found a lot of people I don't like. And I tell God I don't like them. I know they're Christians, but I don't like them. I was always telling you my enemies are all Christians. And I don't like them. But you say, then how do you love them? I don't. It isn't in me to love people. Don't you think my father knew that when he decided to put Christ in human beings, that it wasn't in them to love him? He didn't have people throughout the entire Old Testament who loved them. And if he was going to get reciprocating love back, he needed to put somebody in the creature who could do the loving. He couldn't depend on the creature. And you know what? As I give in to Christ and he becomes my life, he becomes the lover. And the people I don't love, he loves. The people I don't like, he loves especially. That's how we're to function. I can't do it within myself. I don't have power. I don't have love. I don't have grace within myself. I don't have love. I'm not wise within myself, and I don't have love. So the first thing about a son of God is he's constrained or controlled by the love of God. 
And when I get in a circumstance I don't like, my first thought goes to Jesus. It's your situation. It isn't mine. I can't handle it. I back off. I pull back. And then somehow by the Holy Spirit, the words come, friend, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to carry this on like this. I try to back out of it, even to the extent of saying, I love you. But you know, Christians always say that and sometimes don't mean it. But I know you mean it if it's Christ coming out of you because that's the real you. The real you is not you. The real you is Christ. Point number two. A son of God hates sin. He hates sin. This is kind of a hard subject because I'm living in a very sinful world. I'm living in a world that has become so sinful, I think, Many of us don't know where to draw the line of what is sin and what's not sin. I think we've been introduced in our generation to this awesome world to where what was once sin to me is no longer sin. Maybe it isn't. But it, we have come to a place that we don't know what sin is anymore. We are faced with sin on every hand. Uh, radio, television, newspapers, magazines, books. Sin is so rampantly portrayed in all of these things that you don't know whether they're so anymore. When we have a leader of our land who claims to be a Christian who says that sin is not sin, is, is not is anymore. It's not sin anymore. That's kind of the picture of the world we live in, isn't it? We don't know what is sin. The people who produce television shows say they're not bad. They're not affecting the children. Politicians say it's okay for us to believe one way one day and another way the next day. That's not bad. That's the way it is. You ever listen to the politicians talk? We have to go along with what is. We have to balance it all. You know what a balanced life is? It's something that don't believe anything. We don't know what sin is anymore. But a son of God hates sin. It's just that we've gotten used to it. I grew up in Waco, Texas. Waco, Texas is a strong Baptist town because the largest Baptist institution in the world is in Waco and Baylor University. And when I grew up in Waco, we never had a liquor store or a beer joint. If you wanted to buy liquor or beer, you had to go out of our county because every election that came up, the Baptists could vote it out. There were so many of them there. They would vote it out every time. So I grew up where there were no liquor stores or beer joints. The worst place we had in our town was a pool hall but they couldn't serve liquor there. So I grew up without any of that in the environment. Years later, when I left college and moved to Dallas, Texas, there was a liquor store on every corner, I'll declare. And that's the most astounding thing I thought about Dallas when I moved there. Boy, there's liquor stores everywhere. There's beer joint everywhere. You can't have a block. You don't have one of them in there. They're like 7-Elevens back then. Always had one where there's people. And I thought, that's awful. I thought this is an ungodly city if there ever was one. But the years went by. And as the years went by, you know what? I never saw liquor stores anymore. And I remember one day as it came to me, a fellow asked me where I was, how do you get over here to this place? And I said, well, I tell you, you go down here to the end of this block, there's a liquor store, 
turn right and go one block and turn left. There's another liquor store on that corner and go down three or four blocks. I directed him to where he wanted to go by liquor stores. What had happened? They didn't bother me anymore. They were a part of the city. They were a part of the neighborhood. They were buildings like any other buildings. I'd gotten used to it. Used to it. You know how easy it is to get used to sin? That's what's happened to us. Sin is a violation of our knowledge. James said, if a man knoweth to do right and doeth it not to him, it is sin. It's a violation of our knowledge. Point number three. A son of God rejects the world. There will come a place in your walk with God as a son of God where you will see this world can do nothing for you. This world will need to be rejected. Remember, there was only one man God ever gave authority to to run this world, and that was Adam. And he lost that authority in six days. So since that time, nobody's ever had the ability to run this world. The world offers you nothing. The world can't make you better. Becoming famous and great, rich and powerful in this world gives you nothing. The world has no answers. So a son of God deep inside of him rejects this world. We're strangers and sojourners. We're ambassadors for Christ, and we are soon to be lifted out of this environment. While we're here, we're to let people know that this world has no answers to your life. You're never going to straighten it out. It's never going to get any better. It's going to get worse and worse. We're here to tell them that. That's what we as ambassadors are doing. We were like ambassadors back in England years ago when they started saying there's going to be a war. Hitler is moving. Hitler's moving. He's going to move in on England. They were there to tell them that. That's what we're here to do is to tell them. We're not to change the world, but we're to tell the world that judgment is coming and they need to get right with God. Oh, you know what's missing in our world? It's judgment. You don't have anybody hardly preaching firestone, fire, fire and brimstone anymore. That's kind of old-fashioned, old duddy. Well, it's not as powerful as grace. But this world is wicked, and we need to reject it as an answer to our lives because we're in Christ. Point number four, a son of God looks for the coming of Jesus. He looks for the coming of Jesus. You know what that means? That means that we believe in something that's so old-fashioned, the majority of born-again Christians, so-called, don't believe it. The majority of Christians do not believe in the return of the Lord. The majority of preachers do not believe in the rapture. Why do I believe in the rapture and the coming of the Lord? Because it was in the seed. It was in the seed. When God dumped this great big bucket of grace on me, one of the things he put on me in that seed was, I'm coming back. I will return. I'm coming back. He is coming back. He's returning. He's going to return. How do I keep looking for him every day? It's in the seed. i got something in me that wants to eat every day. That's in me. Thank God it's in me. I understand when you don't have that desire to eat, you're dying. I have a desire in me to eat every day. But in my spirit, I have a desire in me to see Jesus every day. If he don't come today, he's coming tomorrow. How could you keep looking for him when he doesn't, doesn't come? It's because it's in the seed. He is coming. Last of all, a son of God is constantly 
growing deeper in his union with the Christ that's in him. He never gives up the search. He never stops. He never says, well, I know all about that. I don't want any more. A son of God never stops because that's the biggest thing that ever happened to him, and he doesn't know all about it. He needs to keep growing in it. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Not going to be we are that now. And this is what the world needs to and ought to see. Praise God. Well, I quit right there.